there are so many verses in the book of Revelation I used to not understand. And now I'm at a place where there's so much scripture that comes alive to me when I'm reading the book of Revelation. Now, I'll give you some tips before we start. The book of Revelation is like a culmination of everything that's ever been said before. As I've said many times, the book of Revelation is not a new revelation. It's not a new vision. It's a culmination of everything that God has said, everything the prophets have said, everything that's ever happened in the Bible comes to a climax in the book of Revelation. So you cannot read the book of Revelation without referring to the rest of the Bible. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to be doing that. Whether you think I'm getting off topic or not, I don't care. Because when I read the book of Revelation, other scriptures are coming to my mind. So we literally will be all over the Bible. So we're going to start Revelation 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. The words are alive to me. Now the revelation, the word revelation is really apocalyptos, which means to reveal to open up something that's hidden. It is too bad, but the church has been teaching the world the meaning of revelation as far as their terms, and what they've described as the revelation is the apocalypse. It's a twist on the word apocalyptos. Because the book of Revelation is not an apocalypse. It's not a destruction of physical things. It is a revelation. This revelation is from Jesus Christ. The same Jesus that taught in parables. The language of God. This book to most people, is tongues to them. Because they do not bother to learn the words. There have been many, many people study the book of Revelation and then even make a living out of teaching it. They have messed us up so badly. So we need a fresh approach. We need to understand the book of Revelation is from Jesus Christ. He's going to talk to us the same way that he talked to us in the rest of the New Testament. There's imagery in every word. So try to keep that in mind. It is an opening up of things you did not previously understand. And to many people, it has been a closed book, I know. But it's not a closed book to me. I am thrilled every time I read this book. Now, the second thing. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. God gave his son this revelation. Mm -hmm. And if Jesus was God, he wouldn't need the revelation? If Jesus was God, he wouldn't need the revelation. Mm -hmm. Right? Right? I'm going to say something about the Trinity teaching right here. The Trinity teaching does not teach the unity that the Bible shows you between the Son and the Father. No. The unity is beyond what you could understand. The reason I believe people need the Trinity to try to talk about unity between the Father and the Son is because they're still carnal, and the only unity they can see is a physical union. No, the Son is 
at one with his Father. I am more at one with the message that I carry than I am one with my wife, my children, my brothers, my sisters, my father, my mother. I know what unity means. I can go about my work at home, all the things that I have to do. Even though I'm working, I'm still one with the message that I carry. That's the kind of unity we're talking about. It's not a physical union, is it? Well, I was just thinking about unity in this, when it happened in the book of Acts. Yes. People were in unity with the same message. Mm hmm That's why they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Sure, sure. Because they were one. Yeah. I'm going to go to a scripture that talks about the proper oneness. The Trinity doesn't teach this kind of unity. They're trying to make it a carnal unity. There is a unity between Jesus and his Father that is beyond what the Trinity could ever put across. John 17 verse 11 says, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Now, think about this. Jesus and the Father are one. And he's saying that they may be one even as we are one. I can use Mark and Lori as my example. Because we've learned together, do we think alike? I'm watching videos and I'm asking you guys questions and you're giving me the answers and it's almost like someone slipped you the answers. You're cheating. You're cheating. <laughs> no, it's because we think the same. Sure, sure. We have enough word in us. Like the last couple of videos, I asked some pretty difficult questions and you were just Bang, bang, there it is. Right? Do you see what I mean by oneness, one accord? We have the same mind, the same heart, the same desire, through the same methods. Yes. Yes. What are we doing? We're taking in the Word of God. That's oneness. That's it. Now, Jesus is praying for all those that believe that they may be one. Now, you see, Jesus is not talking about a physical oneness, is he? Yeah. The same kind of oneness that I and the Father have. The Trinity doesn't teach that kind of oneness. They can't understand that God and Jesus can be that close in unity. Yeah. Other than being physically united somehow. Yeah. They can't see how people can have the same mind, the same heart, the same desires. Think of a couple. They have a home. They have a life. They have a routine. They have their jobs. But yet... They both work together to make it all work out. Let's say they have one car. They have to share that vehicle and still make it all work out for the whole family. Does that take oneness? Mm -hmm. oh, sure it does. Yep. It takes cooperation. Cooperation. Yes. Good word, Mark. Jesus is at one with the Father, not because they're physically the same being. They were joined at the heart. Yeah. He cooperated with his Father fully. He said, I've not come to do my own will. 
came to do the will of my father. There's a son a father can be proud of. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave to him. Now there's a purpose. And Jesus is sharing the same purpose as God. And then he wants us to know what this revelation is. God gave it to him so that Jesus could show his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Now, I dealt with this before. I love the word must. Must shortly come to pass. And I've studied this word throughout the New Testament. It's a determination. It does not say it shall come to pass or it will come to pass. It must come to pass. There's a determination involved, not only from God and his son, but also the servants. Why is he showing his servants this vision? Because all these things must shortly come to pass. Now, this is where people will ask, well, my goodness, it's been 2,000 years. Why isn't it come to pass? I'll be honest with you, because God for 2,000 years has not had servants that are one with him. They've had their pet doctrines and they've established denominations over the years. They've done so many things. But be one with God? Like his son was one with his father? No, it hasn't happened. That's why it's taken so long. Like I said before, those of you that teach the sovereignty teaching, you don't understand God waiting for Noah. You have no clue why God would wait almost a hundred years to bring judgment. Because he told Noah, and it's written there, I will no longer strive with flesh. That's God's attitude toward the flesh. So many people are frustrated with the way the world has gone. Do you think Noah was frustrated? Mm -hmm. I know his family was. Because when they named Noah, his name actually means, finally we get some peace. We get some rest from working with this soil full of thorns and thistles. They knew when they named Noah that there was coming an end. And 1 Peter 3.20 says God waited. So we're not talking about God waiting for a hundred years, are we? You take 500 years and add 100. How long has God been waiting? Well, his life was 600. Yes, when he finished the ark, he was yeah. around 600. Yeah. We can read that in Genesis. We know that. Mm -hmm. So how long was God waiting? He was frustrated with man long before this. Oh, sure. I mean, however many years it was since the fall. Do we understand the patience of God? <laughs> the long suffering? I mean suffering long. So why is the book of Revelation saying things which must shortly come to pass. Yeah. yeah. This is something that's hard on the head, but God's been waiting for people to read this book and understand it. There's not been any men to understand this book. Hal Lindsey never understood it. He just led us further into carnality. Sure. He takes this verse, which God showed 
John and he jumps out of this verse and he says then Jesus took John transported him to the 20th or the 21st century and showed him technology and then had the gall to say so you see this prophet didn't know what he was looking at so he wrote down 21st century technology in first century terms you just confused the body of Christ beyond imagination. When we're reading the book of Revelation, which is full of parabolic language, don't ever guess. I've learned. I've literally gone through this book and studied every word. Why? Because I know these words have been used before. Here's another word I'm going to help you with. He signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now, I read that a certain way. You don't have an angel plus John. The angel is John. Ted, that sounds like a leap. Nope. No, it's not. All you have to do is study angel. Study the word angel, which is in the Greek, angelos, all the way through the New Testament. And you're going to see that the New Testament uses the word angel or messenger. So, at the beginning of the New Testament, you have John the Baptist. John the Baptist had disciples. And the disciples went to see Jesus. And in the Greek, it says, John the Baptist's angels went to see Jesus. Now you can see why the translators of the Bible couldn't use the word angel, because they're thinking the same way that carnal men do today. You can't say John the Baptist angels. They're the messengers of John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So rather than us struggling with the word angel, Ted, how come you see John the Apostle as the angel? Because he's the messenger. <laughs> Does that make sense? He's the messenger of this vision. He's about to write it down. Yeah. He's the angel. He's the messenger. Now, this is going to help you when you go through the rest of the book, you've got the word angel. Convince yourself in your mind that sometimes when I'm reading, I'm going to remember to say messenger, representative. Why in the world would God give a revelation to Jesus to have to give it to a so-called angel from heaven to give to John? That doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. Why? Because you've done a lot of reading, haven't you? Yeah. God speaks directly to the prophets in the Old Testament. Yeah. Right? They are the messengers of God. Mm -hmm. If you understand what I'm saying, you could say they are the angels of God in the Old Testament. Yeah. Messengers. Representatives. Speaking on the behalf of. So I'm going to help you with this. Because I've studied the word angel, and I know that it means something else besides just heavenly beings. Yeah. I just am going to go to the Old Testament and look at the Hebrew word for angel. It means, it's an unused root meaning to dispatch as a deputy, a messenger, specifically of God, that is, an angel, also a prophet, priest, or teacher, ambassador, king, and the word messenger again. Now, because I've studied the word angel all the way through the Bible, I have no problem seeing John as the angel. Because I know what it means. I would say that was Christ as the angel 
taking it to John and then John it's you, both. takes it on. It's yes. both. Yes. Because he was the messenger also. Jesus was the messenger as well, speaking to another messenger. This is what you have to understand as you go through this whole book. Because many times there are angels, messengers, coming out of the temple, giving something to other messengers. See the pattern? Now, Jesus is a messenger of God. He's an ambassador of God. He was sent from God. That's another word that I've studied when I've studied angel, because it means to be sent. So we've got this word evangelist in the Bible. Ev, angel, I-S-T. See? The evangelist has been turned into something by carnal men. They say, well, it's someone that wins souls. No, no. You're not understanding the original meaning of the word. An evangelist is a messenger of God. Because the word angel is right there in the middle. John is an angel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is an angel of God. Now, people are thinking we're making a leap. No, we're not. Because you're thinking carnally. You're thinking a person can't be another thing. No, we're not talking about another thing. We're talking about the duty. The purpose. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Remember I said, I feel more at one with the message. Think of all the messengers in the Old Testament when they spoke to the kings. All the kings that didn't listen. Just because you're a messenger of God doesn't mean people will listen. That is exactly it. Jesus was a messenger of his father. And he was the ultimate messenger. Yes. A son. Mm -hmm. A man who carried the true word of God. Yeah. He sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Now you're going to see this phrase, the testimony of Jesus Christ, throughout the book of Revelation. Yeah. I can remember as a kid, I attended a Pentecostal church and we'd all have this time called, it's time for testimonies. <laughs> And I'm thinking, as I'm reading this, this is not about my testimony, is it? This is the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's our message. It's not the testimony of my life. Because my life doesn't do anything for anyone. No. It's the testimony of Jesus Christ who bear record of the word of God. Now, Hal Lindsey will actually read this scripture and say, all that he saw, and he'll say, Jesus transported John into the 20th century and recorded all that he saw. John wasn't recording what he saw on earth. He was recording what Jesus showed him in the Spirit. Yeah. John wasn't looking at technology. My goodness. Do you know how carnal the church has become? They swallowed all of that teaching, and then you have Tim LaHaye and Jenkins writing their Left Behind series, making movies making millions of dollars. Yeah. We voted with our pocketbooks. We approved of their message. And then people come to me and say, the church is doing just fine. I tell you, the church has been a mess 
since the first century. God is waiting for a people to read these things, the book of Revelation, and understand. Because he's bearing record of the word of God. Again, I'm going to mention, the book of Revelation is full of the word of God from the rest of the Bible. Verse 3, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So people would say, well, my goodness, I guess the time has been at hand since the first century. No, no, no. We haven't had people to hear, understand, and keep these words since the first century. Well, that's why he says we're like in the days of Noah. Exactly. Being married and getting married. We just go on with life. Yeah. Has anyone been interested in going past the carnal? No. I don't see anybody. We've had lots of carnal teachers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Blessed is he that readeth. Well, I'll just pick out the words I see. They pop out to me. Read. Hear, keep. Yeah, yeah. Read, hear, keep. Now, what does keep mean? Because, you know, I hear people all the time, we need to keep the word. Okay, what does that mean to you? Well, I know what it means in the Bible. The word keep is to take in and guard. Mm -hmm. Why do you have to guard it? Well... If you understand that people have been carnal for 2,000 years about this book, you have to keep it in your heart yeah. and guard it because there's so much other teachings about this book bombarding us. Think about it. We're not just talking about you go to a conference. This is everywhere. Everybody's using the word apocalypse. We have all of this influence from everyone, from Christians to just people that are uninterested in the Bible, declaring the last days. It's all around us. So you read, hear, and keep. Why do you have to guard it? Because all this stuff is all around you. Keep it in your heart. Yeah, because even the elect can be deceived. Even the elect can be deceived. Again, for the time is at hand. Well, it's been that time then since John wrote it down. Yes. Yes, because God's been waiting. See, the thing is, people that teach all about this carnal uh, uh, interpretation of the book of Revelation don't understand. God waits. God waited for Noah from his birth to the finishing of the ark. That's 600 years. That's a long time to wait. And you don't think God doesn't have the patience to wait now? He's been waiting for people to read this and understand it. Read it, hear it, and keep it. Hear means to understand it. Not to read and then guess. Yeah. I won't fall for that trap. When I read the book of Revelation, there's words. I will look in the rest of the Bible to see how those words are used. Yeah. Yeah. Like Angel. How did I come to the conclusion that I have? Because I've studied in the word, the use. The use of the word. Every time people see the word angel, they automatically think it's some kind of angelic being. Mm -hmm. It's a being. No, it's a messenger. Whether man or heavenly. Then, John starts writing it. He says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. By the way, 
Did you see that? The messenger. He's not afraid to say, yeah. I'm the messenger. Who's writing it? It's coming from John. Do you see John excusing himself for being a messenger? No. I, John. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Well, this, this verse is loaded for me. First of all, you have the seven churches. Now, there's imagery that's going to pop up later. We're going to talk about seven. And guys, please excuse me, but I cannot talk about seven without talking about six. Because that's how I figured out what these numbers mean. Because I had to study six and seven in tandem. Because the book of Revelation is full of sevens. It's also full of the concept of six. Some of you think, well, no, it's not six, it's 666. Well, for Pete's sake, what is the basic number of 666? It's six. So you don't understand because you don't respect the words of God enough. Seven, you find in the first book of the Bible, on the seventh day, and by the way, you also find six in the first chapter. On the sixth day, man and beast. That's what you see in Revelation 13 too. Yeah. The number of a man, the number of a beast. What we have to do is quit guessing and quit listening to these carnal teachers about this book. They think, oh, it's a number, a specific number, and if you, we use gematria, we can say that 666 is Nero or someone like Nero. No, you've just jumped out of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Just like that, you're out of the Bible. Six is explained in the Bible all the way through the Bible. Seven is a, explained in the first page. And it is explained through the rest of the Bible. You don't have to step outside this book in order to gain understanding of this book, the book of Revelation. Seven churches, seven spirits, and the language is going to continue. You're going to see lots of sevens. You're going to see seven lamps. You're going to see seven eyes. You're going to see seven horns on the lamb. Now, if you're thinking physically, isn't that a strange-looking beast? Yeah. A lamb with seven horns and seven eyes. What are we saying? John is an apostle of Jesus Christ speaking in parabolic, prophetic, spiritual language. We have to show God some effort in going into the rest of the Bible and understanding the use of these words. Seven, when you think about it, it can mean completeness, right? God, on the seventh day, rested. And he looked at all that he had made and said, it's good. Seven means all of that. Some people will argue, well, seven just means rest. No, keep reading. God looked at all that he made, and it was good. Something else that I've learned, words can start in the book of Genesis and then grow in meaning until they end in the book of Revelation. Like six. Six is a good example. So on the sixth day, you've got man and beast. Yeah, so you have the sixth day, and then you have the work of man. They, As long as you're in six, you're not at seven. That's why I had to study seven and six together. 
because six is not quite getting to seven. You're not, you're almost there, but you're not. You have to work before you rest. When I read in the New Testament, Joshua could not get them into rest. So the apostle said, well, that means there's still rest for the people of God. Then he said, strive to enter. That doesn't make sense. Strive, strive to enter the rest. It's just like Jesus teaching when he talked about the wide gate and the narrow gate. Do you have to strive to enter the gate? What are you striving at? You're leaving the crowd. It's just like the guy that, uh, the fellow that was looking for the treasure. He had to strive to find the treasure. <laughs> you have to dig. Dig. No, <laughs> this is that double-sided coin again that I was talking about. Do you think God's going to do all the work? No. I'm showing you that God is unfolding a plan. The plan are for the people of God, all the servants of God, all the servants of Jesus Christ, that we then can work toward. Now, this, you see, there's so much religious teaching, people will actually get angry and say, how dare you say that we have to help God? Well, come on, did Noah help God? Did Abraham help God? Did the prophets help God? Let's well, just think of it. Goodness. Way. Did Jesus, Jesus help, help God? God? <laughs> yes. You and I are thinking the same thing. And we think we're just going to sit back and all of this is just going to come to pass. No. Mm -mm. And then it says, and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. Oh, I love this phrase. See, the Word of God is like this too. It was true, it is true, and it'll be true tomorrow. Jesus Christ, the truth that he brought. It was true, it is true, and it will be true tomorrow. Now, later on, you're going to read phrases when you get into the the beast, talking about the beast and, and all of the images that are there, it'll talk about the beast that was and is not, and it yet is. It's a slight difference of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was and is and is to come. The structure around the beast, the leadership, was and is not, and yet is. I'm going to say this. It's like an idol. Yeah. In the minds of men, you see, the idols were fashioned. It was, in the minds of men, they fashioned it. It is not, and yet it is. This idol is lifeless. And yet, it is. How is it? How does it have any power? It doesn't have any power all by itself. An idol cannot see or hear or walk or talk or smell. Yeah. It needs the help of men. Needs men. That'll help you with the language that comes up later. Yeah. He was and is not and yet is only in the minds of men because it's not reality. Just like that idol is not reality. It's a wrong concept of God that men have made with the work of their own hands. Jesus, he was and is and is to come. He's the truth. He said that, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Well, he was the truth, he is the truth, and he's the truth. 
as you read this book. Because mm -hmm. every one of us have been trained. We think this book is the future. I'm saying it is. It's true. Right now. Why? Because it comes from the voice of Jesus Christ, who was and is and is to come. These are his words. It was true when John wrote it. It is true because it's still written. And it's going to be true because what's written gets in the hearts of true believers. I think I'll end it there.